You ever watch a show and think to yourself, is this confusing or am I just stupid? Hey, it's Nicole, you don't care that much, let's move on. Shadow and Bone is a new Netflix fantasy show adapted from a popular young adult book series. I had seen the show around Netflix for a while, but actually had been actively avoiding watching it because something about the cover art having a mystical stag with like a hundred antlers I don't know, it was too horny and I was never in the mood. Shadow and Bone follows Alina Starkov, a girl who discovers that she is Grisha, aka a person who can perform what seems to be magic and Alina can summon the light. Netflix has described Shadow and Bone as Ocean's Eleven meets Game of Thrones, which yeah, they're doing that startup thing or I guess also book pitch thing where they cross to well-known references to give you context. Sometimes it helps, but other times you're just like, so what does Uber meets Airbnb actually mean? Joshua? Gentrification? In this case though, Ocean's Eleven meets Game of Thrones really just means that this is a fantasy heist with a learning curve. Shadow and Bone also, in classic Game of Thrones fashion, has you often squinting in 1% brightness. Overall, I did enjoy and binge the entire first season in one sitting, but I do have to say that they jammed a lot into the first eight episodes. A few storylines felt like they had been taken from completely different shows, like certain characters, the filming style, and other pieces just never really fit together exactly. More on this later. As someone who still hasn't read the books, I definitely felt like this show was more geared toward the book fans, which isn't to say that you can't like it without all that extra context. I mean, even when I was lost, I was still very interested. The fold ate your parents. Um, okay. I just mean that you can get a lot more out of it if you have read the books. The series was originally written for 10 episodes, only got 8, and also some characters were taken from separate books, which partially explains why a lot of things seemed rushed. However, even though the books and some outside context would probably fill in the gaps that the show left, I still think that the show should be able to stand on its own, so I'm going to try to evaluate it on its own merits. We start the episode with a shovel of foreshadowing. When I was young, I was afraid of the dark. I learned that darkness is a place and it's full of monsters. This episode is called A Searing Ray of Light. Hmm. Your typical light versus dark motif. Our setting is a country called Ravka, loosely based off Tsarist Russia, which I don't think is very common in a fantasy series. You can tell by the visuals that a lot went into building this world on the author's and Netflix's part, though there has been criticism that the author didn't appropriately research Russian culture and terminology before misusing both, and then just really using it for the aesthetic. Alina Starkov is an orphan, of course, and cartographer for the First Army. I wish her map-making job said a little bit more about her personality and or skills, because as far as I know, and I know very little, it never really comes back. Alina is reunited with her childhood best friend Mal, who is a tracker also for the First Army. There are flashbacks, many more to come, about how they were there for each other in their orphanage days. We then see that also fighting on Mal and Alina's side are what look like avatar benders. They're called Grishas, and even though I know there is a reason for this, I still really find it funny that Grisha is like the nickname for Grigori, just like how Greg is the nickname for Gregory. So essentially the second army is like an army of Gregs. Cut to season two when they reveal the final boss and it's just Danny Gonzalez. <laughs> Fastest growing army on the internet. Anyway, the most succinct way that I can explain the geographical context is that Ravka is at war with its north and south bordering countries. These countries are based on Scandinavia and China slash Mongolia. East and West Ravka, however, are split by this magical, dangerous, unknown area called the Fold. We are never going to see it go away. Just saying to consume the sun will destroy it. If only there was a girl who fit that job description. Couldn't be me though. Good luck. To get from one side to the other, you have to cross through the Fold. Then Mal is chosen to go on what's essentially a death mission to the other side of Ravka and retrieve some supplies. Both of them are absolutely floored. I don't know how Mal was so sure that he wouldn't get drawn. I feel like if I were in that kind of lottery, I would just always assume it'd be me. 
Lena volunteers as tribute in her own special way by burning all the maps that they have of the other side so that they are forced to take her with them to redraw the map. I recognize this as a way to differentiate Alina from the other cookie cutter YA protagonists as a way to give her more agency, but oh my god. She just sentenced her entire map making group to die. And that, my friends, is some main character energy. So they get on a boat to go through the folds. And at this point, I'm embarrassed to inform you that I still did not realize that this boat was going through sand and not water. Then in the darkness, their only light goes out. Couple problems here. First, I don't get why that original light wouldn't have attracted monsters. Second, it wasn't believable to me that someone would be dumb enough to light another lantern. But more importantly, why are so many people, let alone map makers, on deck, in the open, in the dark. The monsters in the fold start killing people, of course, and then one wounds Mal. One picks up Alina, who becomes a glow stick. One guy who hopped off the ship earlier somehow makes it all the way there on foot. On the other end of the fold, we're introduced to a separate cast of characters for the Ocean's Eleven heist narrative. At this point, as someone who had no book context whatsoever, respectfully, I am confused as hell. This trio game, Kaz, a club owner, Jesper, a sharpshooter, and Inej, a spy, hears of a job that can make them some serious bank. Some rich guy is hiring someone to bring back something from the other end of the fold in return for a million Krug, their currency. Kaz decides to stand out from the other applicants and bring this guy something else that they hear that he's looking for, a heart render. The show said to me, you don't know what a heart render is? suffer. The trio finds that rich guy has a prisoner who turns out to be the same guy who hopped off that ship. We learn that heart renders are a type of Grisha that can accelerate or just change and I guess monitor people's heartbeats, which makes heart renders really good human lie detectors. Under interrogation, the prisoner says that he saw a sun summoner, aka lightbender Grisha, destroy all the monsters with light. Three guesses who? After that guy snitches, Rich Guy gives him stitches and gives the trio until sunrise to figure out a way to get across the fold and bring Alina back. Presumably a sun summoner is worth a lot of money. So that is the first of eight episodes. We've kicked off two of the main storylines, Alina's typical young adult chosen one narrative as well as the heist narrative of the trio, which calls themselves the Crows. Let's talk the Alina storyline first and all the YA cliches and tropes that come with it. Alina carries out the Hunger Games self-sacrifice. There's the typical light good, dark evil motif, especially when she meets the incredibly predictable evil Alexander, the supposed yin to her gang. This guy is a Grisha who controls the dark while she controls the light. He trains her before essentially betraying her, and there, of course, is a love triangle. The attempts to give Alina's character some agency are pretty transparent, but at least there are attempts. She presents the typical sassy, headstrong female lead that often ventures into stupidity, like talking back to powerful people and ignoring advice and then going to strike out on her own. Take the path to the right. You'll find food storage. Wait there. There are some Grisha who are loyal to me. They will help keep you safe. I don't have a better idea, but... Nah. An interesting discussion regarding Alina is the choice to make her half Asian as opposed to the OG white girl. On one hand, it's cool to see someone Asian being the lead in a Netflix fantasy. It makes sense to play up why her character feels like such an outsider. You can control me where I see her. To get a better view from your country. She grew up here. Could start by making her eyes not shoot. I guess she's shooting up. There's also that dynamic of her being treated so poorly by her own country and then kind of being forced to save it. <clears throat> Naruto. The writers went beyond colorblind casting, changing up the script to make it relevant to her race. Then what are you? What are you? What are you? I'm Ravkin. These are some real world insults, which is kind of unexpected because fantasy is about escapism and all that. It was nice to see Alina redefine herself as more than whatever stereotypes she faced. No first words to me, but what are you? This is what I am. But she is the only one to experience this, even though there are plenty of other minorities in the cast. I'm excluding the discrimination versus Grisha because I'm not really sure that Grisha are a race. They're very diverse in appearance and can hide their powers. Yeah, the country Ravka is at war with Shu Han, 
but they're also at war with another country too. And especially if you're modeling this after real life racism, that's not something that you can just confine to a single race depending on who you're warring with at the time. I've heard people say that the show could have included more good bits about being Asian, just so that being Asian isn't just like defined by racism. However, I feel like that's pretty difficult considering Alina doesn't know any Shu Han yet, I'm assuming, and she doesn't know their culture. And this is actually the true experience of some Asian Americans. Anyway, I believe that Netflix will probably introduce more Shu Han in the second season. As for Mal, the plot armor is strong with this one. I strongly feel that this guy should have died at least like three times. I'll meet you at the And not only does he not die, he finds this mystical stag that the series villain has been wanting in the span of an episode, whereas the series villain had like a hundred years to get it done. To be fair, with my track record, I probably would have waited until like the 99th year too. Now for the pros. The showrunner's decision to combine characters from the Shadow and Bone trilogy and the Six of Crows duology was, in theory, a smart one. The Crows characters are very popular among existing readers, and new viewers who might be bored of the formulaic YA storyline might be intrigued by the heist. As a newcomer to this universe, I found myself a lot more interested in the heist narrative just because it was a lot more different than the typical chosen one plot. However, I do tend to find secondary or side characters more interesting most of the time because they're less likely to be self-inserts. I mean, the goat is the goat. Also random, but can we talk about how they're going through a metal train through the fold while earlier the cartographers are just milling about on deck in the open? Anyway, I understand why the crows were included, but the execution of it, I'm not so sure about. The camera work for the crows storyline is very different. It glides and it snaps to give you that familiar heist feel. The colors are different too, and the different styles really hurt the show's cohesion, especially for someone who was already feeling really scrambled by what was going on. I also felt really underwhelmed by the scene where the crows let Alina go. It made me feel that they were extraneous to the plot, like what they did didn't actually affect anything in the end. And this was before I even knew that the crows were not supposed to be in the original plot. But back to the show being better for the readers. I just know that I missed a lot of details. I watched a lot of reviews from people who actually read the books, and I didn't notice, for example, that Kaz has an aversion to touch. I didn't even see that he had a limp until halfway through. Alina was supposedly really sickly as a child, which adds to her character. I could have understood better why Alina had to let Mal go in order to increase her sun summoning ability. And magic apparently is not magic, but small science or element manipulation. But do I have any idea how that works? Absolutely no clue. On top of that, if you thought 15 plus characters was a lot, they introduce another storyline with Nina and Matthias. Nina is a heart render who got captured by Grisha hunters. And after she saves one of them, Matthias, he tries to overcome his learned prejudices against Grisha. Classic enemies to lovers. The enemies to lovers dynamic is usually known for being slow paced, but this relationship was introduced later than the other ones and just felt really, really rushed. And this dialogue, oh my. Come on, you miserable lump of muscle! It's not natural for someone to be as stupid as he is tall, and yet, oh, there you stand. I also think that the writers could have dramatically condensed certain scenes that just felt repetitive to me. For one, there were way too many yearning flashbacks. Together. We had each other. We had each other and that was enough. That was everything. Together. Maybe this is fan service, but man, we get it. You hold hands and I haven't done that in years. Rub it in. In the middle of the season, they would also replay certain flashbacks so that we would get what was going on. I saw two identical dresses in the fitting room. The target is wearing one and an inferni about the same height and build was measured for the other. I mean, if they absolutely had to do this, it really would have helped me a lot more in the beginning. Someone who read all the books and actually knows what information will be relevant in the future is probably more able to tell you what should be cut or replaced, so let me know if something comes to mind for you. There are so many fans of the show, which is what led me to watch it, and I hear that this show is an amazing adaptation and actually improves upon the books, which is rare. Despite talking about this critically, I will be joining y'all in hibernation 
as you wait for season two. All right, it's getting dark. If you found this video worthy, please subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and make sure to fight me in the comments. See y'all.